Sarah. Welcome back to Virtual VSC Six Feet Apart. Today, Kristen Mills, our Visual Arts Program Manager, has interviewed Lisey Raskin. She was supposed to be a visiting artist here for the month of June. She's been here before. Lisey is the head of the Sculpture Department at RISD. Kristen and Lisey had a great conversation, and I'm excited to share it with you. Here you go. Hello again. Hello again. <laughs> Thanks for um, meeting with me. and. I'm super excited. Well, I'm psyched to see you. You look, you look good, even if you don't feel wonderful. Maybe today you woke up feeling good. Oh, I, I'm okay. Yeah, I've been um, like doing projects in my house. Oh, well, yeah, and I want to hear about that too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I got renovated my kitchen. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to hear about it. That's exciting. So yeah, I've been. I did a lot, a lot of stuff. I built a room. The room. There's a room behind me that I built, um, oh. and I like kind of made a dust barrier in the wood shop and. It's like a live work situation. Nice. So. Last time I physically saw you, you were talking about this video that I've now watched a few times. I think it was in the making. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So I think you were putting out ideas that you were still working on and it hadn't been animated yet, but maybe you just had some images you had started to make. I think that might be right. That's how I remember it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I was, I understood that the what I had wanted to do was show like a beta version of the what, like the performance lecture, but I couldn't kind of get it together. Oh yeah. So so I did yeah I showed some images, but none of them ended up in the final. But yeah, I mean that's exactly right. Urgency, and then you know like sometimes you feel out of urgency, but like the you know the time is not on your side. So I, I felt that. like it was very impactful. I liked seeing, it was like it was swimming around in your head and you were like, basically like, okay, here's this, here's another piece. Wait, hold on. Wait, there's another one. You know, I felt like that's how I was taking in your information as best I could. <laughs> Cause it was, it's, a, there's a lot to digest there. I liked seeing it that way, actually. Well, thank you. That's really kind yeah. of you. It wasn't like, oh, I've done this. I've written that. This is blah, blah, blah. It was like all right here, you know? So. Yeah. 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 That, um, that was, it was also really hard because it's a new form for me because mm -hmm. it, so now that it became like an animation. Right. I'm not the most animated animation ever, but if. You it's know, great. <laughs> thank you. I, I feel really <laughs> grateful that I, that it got out into the world. And I think it was, it's a, it was a, like you said, a lot of information and like very hard to, you know, you know what it is? It's like when you have a feeling mm -hmm. about the way the world is and then you need to take some time, or I do anyway, the way my mind processes yeah. to sort of grab pieces of information that, that contextualize yeah. and sort of give, I mean, I, I, I believe a lot in like emotional intelligence, but I think when I have language for what my lived experience is, it's, it's really, it's a grounding force. And then it helps me sort of make sense of, like my larger experience. It got synthesized in some ways and then I was able to sort of bring in what had maybe been like a sleeping drawing practice. Cause I really like to draw. Yeah. Um, and I'm like pretty bad at it. Like, <laughs> you know, I never, but it's good. It's good that I never, cause I, I basically arrived at like painting and drawing class and I was like, don't tell me what to do. And I just resisted yeah. everything. I think it's maybe one of my worst and best qualities is that uh, I yeah. sort of resisted the proper way of mm -hmm. learning how to do any of these things. But it, it's just meant that, like, I can sit down and, like, do that. But, I mean, I couldn't really draw. When I see people that have, like, gone to art school and they're, they're like, really fast and proficient at, like, Mm -hmm. transcribing an idea of how something should look very quickly for one another, I'm like, oh, like, that's... That's what I can't do. I think it works in that sense because it's basically like a, almost like a PSA. It's really like, this is information and it's kind of smoke and mirror. So I'm going to break it down for you and simplify it. So it was like you simplified everything that you could. That's what it looks like. So it's in, like intentionally everything is simplified so you can digest it, you know? I mean, you would be my ideal audience in that case. Yeah, because I think depending on where you've gone to school, where you've taught, yeah. the students that you engage with, because the goal would be that anybody would feel like they could bring it into the classroom yeah. as a teacher school. And yeah. then if the students had questions, 
then you can sort of bring that into like a larger module around mm -hmm. like critique, which is like one of our methods that we never talk about. Why the hell do we do this thing? I'm going to begin with a drawing of an object in space and its sidekick, the tree. As we know, trees have systems of roots and roots are tasked with bringing nourishment back to trees. Our consciousness can function like a system of roots. We can expand it so it can enrich and nourish us. Would you lend me your consciousness so we can go on a nourishing and enriching journey together? Great, here we are. We are the people moving around the object in space and its sidekick, the tree. Here you see us involved in a ritual that many of you may recognize, the ritual of gathering around or before an object and trying to decipher its meaning based on what we see in front of us. And when we are at art school, as students or teachers, we call this activity critique. The practice of critique is the practice of empiricism, the theory that all knowledge is derived from sense experience. Empiricism developed in the 17th and 18th centuries, expounded in particular by John Locke, George Berkeley, and David Hume, meaning they use the theory of empiricism to support the activities they took up and to justify the policies they successfully instated. For example, John Locke administered the slave-owning colonies. George Berkeley preached that Christianity supported the owning of slaves. And David Hume wrote extensively about white superiority over everyone else. So you see, the theory of empiricism, implicit in the practice of the activity we call critique, privileges anything we project onto what is in front of us, by encouraging us to deem it self-evident and ignore other kinds of information. This can lead to the substantiation of violent ideas like white supremacy. I had a great second audience or third audience because I, you know, this is a, it's an, an animation that I use. I teach a class for the sophomores that's uh, called Methods, Materials and Makers. And it's kind of like everything that like I need you to know as you enter the major and I wouldn't be able to live with myself unless I told you. So, so it does attend to certain kinds of things. But when I was like the space between the talk at Vermont Studio Center and then the first iteration of the performative lecture, I, I was asking the sophomores, I was like, like, can you talk to me about that, how you're experiencing it? And I, and I do have, I did have the privilege to have, you know, neurodivergent students with learning disabilities, st students with learning difference, non-conventional learners, you know, visual mm -hmm. learners, and they gave feedback. Yeah. I teach in an art school and there are a lot of mm -hmm. students that, you know, have learning difference and learning disability. And, and I think it's when you, when you get some students that are like pretty self-aware around like how they learn and how you can alter material to benefit their learning process. I'm always like, tell me more. Yeah. That was awesome. I really benefited from your work and how maybe you are writing about or other people are writing about your work. You sent me those links to Hyperallergic and to the art blog. But I thought it was fascinating the way the, the, the writer, how she wrote about your work and then how you go in and hyperallergic and talk more about the stuff that you're thinking about. And she was using words like mysticism and fantasy, which I guess if maybe you're looking at your paintings, maybe that's how she was reading that. You know, you are trying to scrape away. You are trying to get down to the nitty gritty. So I thought that was kind of interesting. She was using those words when I would not have used those words for you or your work. Yeah, um, I feel like she was writing in relationship to the, I, I made these like, uh, rep, like how, kind of like replicas of these Joseph Yoakum paintings. Mm -hmm. And then within that, I was really, I was imagining like kind of having like a cup of like coffee, like let's say like in the landscape with, with Jojo and, and like what would I ask them about these drawings? Mm -hmm. And how, the, particularly like the edges, like where there were all these, all this compression, um, like how they were thinking about the, the ways of putting things together, like where the tension was. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that the titling of it, uh, of the, of the way that I engaged with the replicas, like had to, like had to do with this fantasy performance. I think. Engaging with, you know, a, an artist that's no longer on the right. earth. So I think like that may be the root mm -hmm. of, the, of that notion, but I do think that the animation or like this sort of like 
research-based, performative, pedagogical, even like didactic, right? <laughs> Stuff that I make is not, doesn't necessarily have to be related to like the, uh, like the, the other stuff that I make, like paintings, or installations, but, but I do think that they're sort of rooted in this, in meta narratives and, and fictive or fictional portals. Like, I don't necessarily believe in like, like I believe in data, but I don't believe in like unbiased facts. Like I, I just think that we're bringing our, and projecting right. like most of the time, right? it's just this, we're just projecting on each other um, constantly. And, and that, you know, the self that I am right now is really different, let's say, than like the self I was when I presented the, the beta version of the mm-hmm. animation at Mars Studio Center. And the self I am now is like really grateful to hear your response, but the self I was then, who knows what that per- how that person would have responded. So I feel like, like they're, right. So there's this way Like even within our own conception of who we are, we're like constantly time traveling and it's kind of like the best, the best job we can do is to be like, hmm, this is what I, what I think about this at, you know, 4.32 PM on Wednesday, May 13th. And like, that's all I got. It's hard to like hold anything in this way. And, and if you don't mind me sort of like skipping to like another spot. um, Please. So in, in 2003, I did a, like a research trip to this, nuclear power plant that's the same design as Chernobyl that mm-hmm. is 70 kilometers north of Vilnius in Lithuania oh, called the Ignalina nuclear power plant. And I recently got an email from a curator who is uh, creating a show at the CAC in Vilnius about the nuclear power plant. Wow. And, and she had, I mean, incredibly insightful. Her name's Elle Carpenter, but had questions about the formation of the work. And I was like, oh my God, that was like 17 years ago. Wow. I feel so weird about that project, the yeah. pro- my engagement with it. I, I couldn't even kind of contend with the mind space of the person who made it. And yet, mm-hmm. as, as her representative, like mm-hmm. I had to feel the questions about like what I was thinking. And, oh my God. And, I mean, it's kind of like the, I don't believe necessarily, I actually don't believe in the self, sorry, but uh, like I believe in interbeing mm. um, and I believe in like co-created realities, like we're making an amalgam and like sort of like every time I'll see you, I, like I'll, I'll, I have like certain architectures that like you bring to me and I remember and you know, we a similar location in Philly and then mm-hmm. we've been in similar locations like other other parts of like you know, the, the eastern seaboard yeah. and, and and it's those things are never removed from right. like my future or present interactions so i think it's like if imagining like states of self or time as like stacks of glass or lenses that you know we're looking through it's hard to you know is the truth the thing i'm telling you in the present that i may you know disagree with in five years right and so funny when as artists we're we're sort of like you know we write about something because it feels so final in a way that if you know you know as a studio artist like it's so much about process and I mean there are some artists that kind of decide they want to make a thing and then they walk it back and then do a set of action steps and I'm I'm really not that artist right like that anything makes sense at all or functions is like always bewildering (laughs) With regard to like the, the, the studio art, painting or any of the installation constructions, like it's all improvised and yeah. maybe I, I set up a set of constraints. It's not like I right. have like a, a set of action steps. With this animation, it had to make sense. Mm-hmm. Like right. I couldn't, I could, right? Like even if we can say, oh, well, I missed a bunch of things and this part's ignorant. At a certain moment, someone else besides me had to be able to established like a rea- like a reality based we're we're consenting we agree with the words like this is a reality based understanding of what the thing meant and that's really different and but i don't know if it is or not like I, i'm having a conflict right yeah i know what you're saying and i guess i hadn't even considered that cuz you know i make videos but if people walk away scratching their heads that's fine i assume that's what they're doing and if people get something out of it i didn't put in there even better because I'm like yeah so glad you saw that and said that now I'll say that (laughs) you know 
it's, I guess it's more like writing a book, but it's like, it has to have this through line that makes sense. It starts somewhere and ends somewhere and all the stuff in the middle uh, supports all that. It's very linear. And like you're saying, you don't seem to possibly make or think in a linear way. So to have a product, which it is a product now, have a linear I don't know, trajectory. Yeah, that's difficult. Yeah, it's super difficult. And in a similar way, although like with the, with the band Peebles, mm -hmm. like that was also like completely confusing, right? I mean, in the sense of, and I mean like every single band member is like has their own relationship to the origin story, the creative process. And, and so like I have my perspective, but like the great, you know, it's not, it's not like hierarchies exist and power relations, like asymmetrical power relations are a huge part of any social interaction. But with that one in particular, like I was their teacher. That's why I was asked about that. Yeah. Yeah. I was their professor. Right? <laughs> like it was yeah. like, you know, like I had a title, you know, it was like this whole yeah. thing. And, and it was like, you know, two of them, Kels and Jojo were undergrads, right? right. With them, like we had such a beautiful semester like mm -hmm. in this advanced painting class where like graduate students and undergraduates be together oh. in an advanced painting class mm -hmm. and let sculpture graduate students take an undergraduate advanced painting class and and then we mostly like we we did a lot of crits and like mm -hmm. I gave assignments and whatever but like we read a lot of feminist theory mm -hmm. we, we read a lot of like black feminism you know and a lot of things like you know the undercommons like Moten and Harney like like meant to question this idea of like what we were doing in school together what was school about what is mm -hmm. what have schools done historically right. and so after when they were like so they were like vibing off each other and like so sort of like tuned in and then at the end of the semester i was like wait I, like i really don't want this to end mm -hmm. but how how can i invite them into another iteration of relationship one that's scripted differently and so you know we came up with this idea of a band mm -hmm. and it wasn't even my idea and so so that's what was also kind of great but at a certain point after i realized what was possible with this group of people still from the perspective of like the professor who i think in a lot of ways what we're charged with is like holding the meta narrative of the classroom and the relationships and like thinking a lot about synthesizing material for you know the like a suite of let's say like a emotional vibrational entities right mm -hmm. and, and so and gov governing that and birthing that and parenting that in, in some way but but i saw that like it was just profound what was happening and then i was like i have an idea <laughs> like i want to make this children's album with them and then i like told them about the idea and they were like this sounds like your idea that's like your idea you know <laughs> and, and and i was like yeah like so then i kind of like in a way like had to get buy-in and then i had to like relinquish control mm -hmm. you know because like for me the the impetus of the album that we're you know infinitely working on i think is you know marlo thomas and friends free to be you and me which is like like is like I'm born in 1974. Like that was like the feminism. That was like that's like second wave white feminism. That's like Ms. Magazine, Gloria Steinem. And I brought it to them, and I was like, "This is what I listened to when I was growing up. That had an impact on me. What were you all listening to?" And try to get them to think about mm -hmm. you know telegraphing music to kids, imagining that we could insert propaganda in their reality in the form of mantras in the form of responses to very painful issues or questions and alter their cognition, like, and, and in some way. And I was like that, like, I really want to do that. And then they were like, yeah, okay. You know, like, and like with skepticism. And then, then we had to like get through the next hurdle, which was like, what is strengths based ideation? Like what the hell is saying what you want yeah. instead of what you don't want? You know, so I think like through all that, you know, I've never, I've never been responsible for the intelligence behind like the musical composition. I think I, I mean, I may have, I mean, I can do like three chords, like three chord Indigo Girls songs. You know? But like, I, <laughs> yes. I have to, no, it's true. Like that, that's like, I sort of like off there. The propaganda part of it, I was like, okay. Like, you know, I, I was very, like I had to do this thing where I was like really aggressive and then relinquish control yeah and if 
the lyric isn't right, if someone else has another idea, if something else comes in, let the thing be formed. That's how we were relating to each other. Like we'd come together, like Jorge Galvan would like be doing something on the, um, on the Korg synthesizer. And then after a while, someone else would play something and then someone else would play something and then they would just be repeating these things and i'd be like well that sounds like a song so let's go write some lyrics and you know and and so i think it like it, it happened like that but you know if you just imagine someone like doom, 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 like over and over again yeah. that becomes the baseline yeah. you know, for a song and and so i think there were so many things that were happening that were like not verbal but liminal and emotional and interactional that that were happening there and i have like i have nothing to do with that shit like i i'd be like go smoke and come back in the room and i'd be like they wrote a song i was gone awesome you know (laughs) that's great it would move me to tears i just be like there it is like all i all we needed to do is like gather in you know some like a dangerous lead painty peely yeah. studio in Viking Mill, and yeah, it was. It continues to be beautiful. I mean, like I love that group of people. Are you gonna have like a show, or is it just you know to to write an album eventually, um, or you don't know? <laughs> well, I mean, the truth is, I don't know, and I think it's like everything shifted. Like when I left Philly, yeah. that was one thing, and then you know various people moved, you know, so now we're all over the place, Miami, right. Philly, New York, Bogota, you know, and so it's not, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't move in those ways. But I, I mean, I think we're kind of overdue like a Zoom meeting. Yeah. Like Zoom practice. And I think it's kind of like, like, what does that mean to have like a huge idea that is like you're doing collaboratively that is like unwieldy, that has to resonate and feel good for like 10 people? I think the thing that I understood, and this is like also the way that Daniel Zetmeyer, one of the bandmates, brought me to this idea of a prefigurative politic. When you're trying to have the group function like according to what you want to see happen in the world. It's going to impact the way they relate to people from here on out. Like that's pretty amazing. Yeah. And, and they are incredible and they do, especially as like um, some of them are teaching and, and it's yeah. just amazing and beautiful Yeah, uh, and working and, you know, working in horticulture. And yeah. I feel like we seldom as, you know, teachers get a chance to, first of all, know the our students mm-hmm. for the, like beyond, mm-hmm. um, you know, their, their time in school. But then also it's like to have a window into who someone is when they're a sophomore in college yeah, and then watching them move that and like really see their, their thinking evolve and their, the mm-hmm. things that you could see as potential sort of, you know, come to fruition. And I feel like that is, such a profound gift Mm -hmm. um, that they've given to me. And and I see the way that they, they literally are changing in in the ways that they're impacting the world. When you were here last and what you were talking about, I didn't know what you thought about his, his work or if you, if you think about that at all, but his movies, I can't ever get out of my head. Just full disclosure. Like I haven't seen those two movies. I would recommend them. Yeah, I will. That's that's awesome. Like with gratitude toward people that have like such large platforms. Yes, right. That are taking on that content, like for for mainstream audiences. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think like at the core of it, I'm trying to like do the work I'm doing like within my context. Yes. And I so I couldn't speak for. Yeah, I mean, like in primarily white. Uh, institutions of higher education if sort of like Robin D'Angelo as you know someone who like focuses on like studying whiteness I sort of look to her and I'm like okay like this is a, these are issues that white folks need to take up mm-hmm. and because the majority of my colleagues are white folks I'm like right like I'm I should be doing that work I mean I call it white work I mean it's not glamorous like it's not fun mm-hmm. but when I thought about the animation I was like, okay, I'm using the language that we talk about in our field to really talk talk to white people. And it's not that like people of color 
you know, haven't been indoctrinated in some of the same ways. I mean, if you, you know, whatever you, you know, if you went to a certain kind of art school in the United States, you're familiar with these terms and concepts, but the deeper thing, that connection around structural oppression Mm -hmm. and uh, intersectionality, Mm -hmm. I think is something that sort of is elusive. Not, not folks younger than me per se, but uh, like my generation and Mm -hmm. older. Yeah. And I think it's like, it's insidious. Yeah. So, so, and I think it's like, you know, thankfully like, you know, Jordan Peele is doing what he's doing. The students that, you know, are coming in and they will have in a pop cultural sense had interaction via, you know, a Hollywood production with, you know, these concepts and that will help, that will give them a baseline so that it's not abstract. I did not grow up with, the, that kind of representation. Right. You know, I grew up with like, you know, whatever, every queer person in every movie was like insane, outcast, you know, yeah. you know, sexually violated, murdered. I mean, that that is what I come to understood representation was going to be about people like me. Like there's a lot at stake with representation. Mm-hmm. You know? People don't even see, and this is including me. I mean, I get it how much it's it's in our system to believe and say and feel certain things but it's stuff that you can't see he's also dealing with the stuff that you can't see but it's it's like you're preaching to a whole different choir but you're like no 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 no, no. you're actually not seeing all the other stuff that's it's so seeped into your bones yeah so i was radicalized in philly like I did an anti-racist training in West Philly at this org called Training for Change. Right. It was, like just to walk back for a moment, there was an amazing episode where um, Ruby Sales, um, who's a, a an activist, was on Krista Tippett's On Being. He spoke about how in within within her black community, there needed to be a moment where the generation that forced the young people to go to integrated schools Mm -hmm. and endure that violence had to say, I'm sorry, that was hard. And she's like, but white people aren't really kind to white people. We don't like white people aren't necessarily like loving to white people. Like if we, if you came, if your family came to this country and you became white as my family did, you know, we immigrated as Jews. And I mean, I, I probably the first generation of my family that's like solidly white, there's no moment where like we we look at each other and we say like we experience this indoctrination of one of the most violent things which is the erasure of our language the erasure of our culture and then this this capitalist aspirational stuff which is so brutal mm-hmm. and so awful and and like sort of this mercenary capitalist white you know, white supremacy. And and I think it's like, well, how, how does one lovingly embrace white people in a way that is like, okay, like let's change. But I'm talking about coming off of a register of shame Mm -hmm. when someone does do harm. And for goodness sakes, like, just like, let's talk about what are some skills and how do we mitigate this and how do we stop this Mm -hmm. and how, and how do we change like ourselves? And so I think it's kind of like, you know, when people want to do that work, I think it's incredibly powerful. Mm. And I think you can't make anybody do that right, work. Right. But like, how do we make it like so wonderful to be like, oh, well, yeah, my thinking was racist. And there is some thoughts that occur to me that I know are racist. And let me tell you that so that you understand that I am actively working with my racism mm. all the time. I am actively working with my racism all the time. I'm working with my internalized homophobia, internalized misogyny, racism, all the things, right? Like it swirls because I was indoctrinated mm. at, like during the timestamp, I got the ideas in my head mm-hmm. and I have to work with them. And I need to know the difference between how I was indoctrinated and the person that I want to be. And, and then I need to really have a relationship between what's at stake, mm-hmm. like a department head or like a classroom teacher or whatever, mm-hmm. like whatever it is, however we're dealing in the world, there are, there are ways that we can interface w- with, you know, shifting shifts in behavior. But I think it's like one of the hardest things in terms of like white indoctrination is the need to be understood as good. 
but but it, it it is it's a thing to contend with it's a thing to move mm -hmm. and then it's not helped by the ways in which capitalism is just brutalizing all of us right and, and so I think it's kind of like it, it sort of, so those concepts connected together really undo, you know, what's at the heart of this, which is that we really need to be thinking about like how to care mm -hmm. for each other because we're actually like all the same molecules, mm -hmm. you know, like period. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think there's like, you know, obviously there's going to be a bunch of people that like may not agree with me. And, and I would like to walk us together to a place where we can talk through this. But in that we all have to understand that like, we're actually all suffering. Like as white people, we're suffering because of whiteness, because of white supremacy, you know, and that's a conversation among that white people need to be having with each other. Yeah. And, and it's hard. It's hard to do it, but that's, what I understand Bell Hooks to be asking me to do, right. Audre Lorde to have asked me to do, like any of like these profound thinkers whose analysis I benefit from and have felt like freer because of, mm -hmm. you know, like Barbara Beverly Smith, in this bridge called my back. They're like white people, please like tend to your own communities, like mm -hmm. tend to your neighborhoods, tend to yes. yourself. That's really important work to take up. And it's like, yeah, you know, what, what whiteness would have me believe that I need to be like hanging out in like underrepresented communities mm -hmm. and doing my work there. But I'm just like, well then who is going to deal with like yeah. white supremacy in, in higher ed? Uh, right. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. And it's super not fun. Like I sure mm -hmm. I'd rather, you know, not doing it, but I can't not do it. Our survival depends on it. I mean, my survival depends on it. Like people like me, like the little like gender non-conforming little units walking around, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for spending so much time with me. Kristen, thank you. Oh, thank yeah, you. Me so much. Wow, that was so great goes all the way back to Kristen's days back at Tyler. Harlan Mack, our sculpture manager and residential life manager, has a new life lesson for us. Let's check it out. Hi, welcome to another life lesson. Uh, we're going to use a saw today. It's my favorite saw. Uh, it's really small, cuts really well. You can hang it on the wall, it's easy to find, so that's good. Uh, let's see what else. It is really straight, so you can use it as a straight edge. You can also use it to be a square. There's a 90 degree angle, here's a 45 degree angle. It's built into pretty much every handle. Uh, pay attention to uh, the orientation of the saw. Your angles should be just right. You want to make sure it's perpendicular to the surface to get a good straight cut. So you want to put all your weight down onto the long side of the board before you even get started. If your weight's not all the way down, it'll wiggle like this. When I get started, I tend to pull back a couple of times. Now I'm gonna use the square function. Um, to mark a straight line, because it's convenient. It's right here in my hand. I'll even do this side. Uh, this way, I can get my up-down line. Keep your wrist loose. Let the weight of your arm do the work to avoid the bind. When it binds like this, just keep going and just relax and get through it. So this is really easy. Um, I recommend using a handsaw for almost every application that you need it for. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, Harlan. He's always so informative. Thanks everyone for tuning in to Six Feet Apart. See you, see you soon. See you next week. See you whenever. Thanks so much. Bye everyone.